Thank you, Ed. I really appreciate the invitation uh, to be with you all today. Um, this is a topic that's very close to my heart, something I've been thinking about a long time. And you're obviously on the front lines of this. Uh, and I'll be quite brief, I hope, so we can have lots of opportunity to, to think about how this kind of framing might help explain some puzzles that you've kind of experienced, see disparate phenomena in terms of a common kind of unifying lens, um, and then what that means for, uh, for interventions, for, for programmatic choices and, 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 um, and policies. The, uh, the metaphor of headwinds and tailwinds, right, things that make something relatively easy or things that make something relatively hard, I think is useful. Another kind of metaphor we're going to think about is you know, thinking of development as kind of uh, an oil tanker in the ocean, right? So it's, uh, it's some things about it move very, very slowly, and we can anticipate change without being deterministic about it. You can think about what's hard to change, and you can think about where to place and how to, how to manage uh, the direction of that behemoth as it moves through time, and also what things you might be able to do in terms of smaller programs and interventions at the margins that would make life better given what the oil tanker is doing. So it's both about steering the oil tanker and about what to do around the oil tanker in a more nimble, nimble way. Uh, not to mix metaphors too much, you can imagine how headwinds and tailwinds will matter a lot for what you'd want to do to steer the oil tanker and move nimbly around it. So as you've seen, lots of headlines about Africa being the new Asia in terms of economic growth and employment opportunities, poverty reduction. Um, these are just a, a sample of headlines about this process. And just wanted to end with this one, in which to some degree the United States has not quite gotten with the program, perhaps ceded some ground to China, perhaps left Europe with a more influential position in Africa and agriculture that's been hugely important in terms of the GMO debate and other areas where um, the U.S. is kind of trying to catch up with Africa um, in terms of um, anticipating its needs and understanding what's driving headwinds, tailwinds, and so forth. So um, presumably our concern is squarely within agriculture, squarely within smallholder agriculture, and we want to think about what these urbanization trends and economic growth trends mean for the sector of interest. Um, you know, Africa may be catching up fast, but it's very far behind. This chart gives, I think, a really nice picture. Um, it's a style of chart that uh, originated uh, some time ago, and I've updated it with the most recent data to show real income and total dietary energy availability. That's both local production and what you can afford to bring in. Um, and what you see is Africa having risen very, very rapidly in terms of total dietary energy and, uh, and food availability, um, South Asia having started the 90s in a, um, you know, with greater food availability than Sub-Saharan Africa, both about to the same level, um, South Asia having higher income. But clearly, this tendency, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is, is, you know, about to do this. And this is about what happens when you do this. And you enter this period of very rapid economic growth. Yeah, so this is dots. Each dot is from 1990 to 2012. And what you see them is progressing in time. Um, 1990s here, 2012 is there. Um, and of course, this isn't a deterministic world in which everybody lockstep follows each other. But it's not like the high income countries are suddenly going to go like that. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, uh, and you know, you see that the end of the dietary uh, um, excess era. So we're stuck in an era of dietary excess, but we haven't gotten worse in terms of total calorie availability. There's lots of other things going on in terms of the content of food, the composition of those calories, and all of the non-caloric uh, nutrient issues, that, um, not to mention physical activity and so forth as influences on health. But clearly, Africa has a long way to go and clearly, we can learn something about the experience of others in this race um, that, uh, that we hope Africa can proceed on very quickly. So it's important to think about overall economic growth and how that plays out to agriculture. And 
uh, I hope all of you, I imagine many of you, uh, are facing increasing pressure to address specifically the nutritional impacts of agriculture, the nutritional impacts of programming, and how that maps to health, perhaps how that maps to health particularly for infants uh, and maternal nutrition, the thousand day agenda, um, to the extent that that is what um, matters for you. It's very clear that it's closely related to income. Lots of other things matter, but one of the first things that households want, both mothers and fathers, uh, is a better nourished child, a healthier child, um, and that's most visibly measured in child height. Uh, and what you see is, is my kind of depiction of that relationship um, in a way that I hope is, is fairly clear and tells a rich story. Here's income in purchasing power parity terms with each dot being either an observation or an interpolation um, from surveys uh, in 137 countries, there's a total of about 3,500 different uh, either surveys or interpolations, each one showing a national income level and the average height of children. And what I've done is just to shade the dots, each one showing an income level of a country and the average height of children in that country. I've shaded the dots darker for the 85 to 99 period and lighter for the 2000s. So what you see is, broadly speaking, in each of these trails of dots, that would be one country. In virtually every case, the dots are moving from left to right. They're moving from left to right, typically somewhere along this trajectory. You see some outliers. This country, you might be able to guess what that is, a very famous outlier in nutrition world. It's, Guatema it's Guatemala, which is, for its level of income, one of the most stunted populations on Earth, and they've become very rapidly less so. So as they've gained income, they've become more normal in terms of reaching this norm of this regression line. Likewise, there are some countries up here that have relatively high stat tall stature, and those have become more normal in terms of moving towards the regression line. There are lots of variants around the regression line. The interesting thing about the regression line, that norm, is it's shifted So that means at every level of income, children are a little taller in the 2000s. So that's partly a story of ever wider dissemination of vaccination, uh, vitamin A, and other interventions. Partly a result of better market access and other things that promote diet diversity and so forth. Um, and partly the result of programs that have given, at every income level, a more uh, child-friendly, uh, nutrition-friendly uh, world. Lots of stuff is going on other than just diet. So partly there's within diet, diet quality. This captures diet quality in terms of the rise of animal source foods. So just anticipating that is absolutely crucial as people move from um, at the lowest levels of income, so the black dots here are, um, are uh, the fraction of animal source foods in total calories uh, that's on the um, left-hand axis here. So what you see is in the poorest countries in the world, roughly 5% of calories coming from uh, animal source foods, and that stays low and then rises to something like 40%. That's a huge change in the amount of agriculture devoted to those calories, because of course it takes five to 10 times as many crop calories to produce one animal source calorie. So that's a huge explosion of demand for agriculture as a whole, because you're putting it into, uh, um, and total calories of course expands as well. Health and nutrition outcomes are not just diet. In fact, this may be the single biggest contributor to change. And what's interesting about disease transmission, particularly the waterborne disease transmission, is the relationship between what happens and change over time in water sources and what happens in sanitation. So what this chart does is it contrasts each of the surveys that are available from WHO and UNICEF about whether a household has access to improved water sources, whether that's a borehole or a protected well, 
in the dark dots, and whether a household has access to sanitation in the sense of uh, toilets as opposed to open defecation. And what you see is that while access to improved water sources rises from about 40% of households to about 100% of households at a pretty low level of income, use of toilet facilities as opposed to open defecation varies much more and takes longer to get to 100. And it turns out that we have enormous variation in exposure to fecal oral transmission of disease from open defecation. The countries that are perhaps re reaching reasonable levels of dietary quality but still facing tremendous gastrointestinal infection from fecal oral transmission because of open defecation, that's these countries here, have an extraordinarily important sanitation agenda that is not really about improved water because they already have boreholes and protected wells. But the fecal oral transmission occurring after the water source has been improved is still an agenda ahead because of the lag in in the, in the sanitation transition uh, that lags behind some of the other transitions that we've seen. So a lot going on in this development path that takes um, the, the broad mass of people, the, the ocean, the, the, uh, the, the, the oil tanker of, of development out of mass poverty and into um, uh, fulfilling human potential. Clearly, you know, poor, poor people start in rural areas. That's where all of our ancestors began their, uh, their, 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 their uh, economic ascent um, and rely on agriculture for economic opportunity in all the ways that we've seen. And uh, one of the things I've learned in my, um, in my career, it's really important to talk about like specific people. Okay, so you just saw hundreds and hundreds of millions of people in the chart. This is actually the first rural household I ever came to know in any real way in Africa. Um, when I was in college, I went to, took a semester off, went to Haiti after my sophomore year, went to Colombia, and then I wanted to learn about Africa after I graduated. I went to teach high school right near this village um, in this classroom, uh, and this was in 1985 and 86. I was able to go back to Zimbabwe in 2010 um, and found this woman who had come to our school compound um, selling uh, lemons, that was her specialty, was to buy lemons from folks um, and bring them uh, and sell them. And the story of what happened to her children is just very vivid in my, um, in my mind, kind of them moving and, and her telling us what, uh, my wife and I, what um, her trajectory had been for each of the children in terms of either getting through high school and getting, obtaining a certificate or not getting into urban, uh, fairly stable urban life or not, those who had to come home and remain at home uh, or not. So that kind of personal experience um, is awfully helpful, but then you do want to zoom back to kind of the broad stats. Okay, so as we think about this ocean, this uh, uh, oil tanker moving through the ocean, um, the broad picture of rural urban uh, migration and Clearly, it's not like people just move from rural to urban. There's a lot of circular and seasonal and rural to rural migration, as you've heard. There's also, though, a net movement from rural backgrounds into urban settings, urban settings offering the agglomeration benefits that um, are why we're here in a city today. Um, and for the world as a whole, it's important to realize that that process can and does eventually employ all the children of farmers who want an off-farm job. That does eventually happen. In the United States, that kind of convergence uh, you know, eventually happened, eventually happens everywhere, but it takes a very long time. So this shows you the world as a whole total, divided into the total world population, which as you uh, well know, kind of grew at 0.5% a year or so for uh, thousands of years, and then rose at one or so percent, and then entered the population boom period to a rise of uh, three or so percent, and then plateaus out to the maximum we'll eventually reach 
uh, of nine or 10 billion total people. You start with a world that's mostly rural. And if you go back in time, it was 95 or 99% rural. The cities, engines of job creation, employment, and income growth start out at a small fraction of the total and just keep growing to catch up. In the US today, cities being uh, 85 or so percent of US population, such that the rural population, which is declining throughout as a share of the total, nonetheless rises for quite a while. And what's magic about the world as a whole is first, we recently reached a headline moment where the UN estimates that half of all population was in cities. And another headline moment when the rural population of the world as a whole begins to turn down. So what does that mean? We've been planting out all the world's farmland. We've been deforesting the Amazon, moving out in, into forests in West Africa, moving out into deserts. We've been uh, turning uh, savannas into cropped areas from the Cerrado of Brazil all across Eastern Europe and so forth. But the total world's total rural population is about to reach its peak. And there's a lot of scholarship now suggesting that we have actually reached, because the rural population has reached its peak, we've reached peak farmland. In just the same sense as peak oil, we may well have planted out pretty much all the total acreage we're ever going to plant out. And all the remaining action in the world is going to be rising yields. That inflection point may or may not quite have been reached yet in total land, but it pretty predictably has been in total uh, rural population. Now, of course, this is not a deterministic world. It's possible to imagine this oil tanker on the, of, of, of kind of slow change shifting in some way. But it would take something extraordinary, like massive climate change disruption of the world economy, to force us back into some earlier lower income state over here. Now, this change here is very, very slow, very diffuse over large areas. So you wouldn't ever see it in the experience of any individual, but clearly it's a headwind or tailwind that matters a lot. For Africa, the process is the same. The, um, the, the lived experience, the contrast between the aggregate total and the house experience of any household is the same. But the timeline and the magnitudes are completely different. Africa, starting the 1950 period, almost entirely rural. You see the black, the squares are, are is the rural population co covering almost the entire. The total population growth rate being the fastest in the world for a bunch of reasons that are probably familiar to you, high fertility and high mortality coming into World War II under colonialism and so forth. Almost no African population had access to almost any modern medicine at the start of World War II. It's astonishing, but only after World War II, and especially after decolonization, suddenly every vaccine and every vector-borne disease control mechanism known to uh, the rest of the world suddenly became available to African uh, societies. And uh, and uh, child, child uh, uh, mortality rates plummeted very sharply at the start of independence. And that led to this extraordinary child survival baby boom and, uh, and, uh, and rapid, economic, uh, ra rapid population growth. But everybody's in the rural areas at the start of that rural population, of that total population growth. Um, and so although African cities are growing pretty fast in here, they're so small that the increment from year to year is barely able to absorb much of the rural. We get into this period, and African cities, this line is rising, at a percentage annual rate that is faster than the growth of urban populations anywhere else in the world. 
The problem is that these African cities are, each of them, pretty small compared to the mass of rural population. So their rapid growth, and I'm not talking just about uh, Lagos and, um, and Nairobi. Every secondary and tertiary town is also growing faster. And the more data we have about that small and middle-sized city growth in Africa suggests they've been booming too. But their booming is not nearly enough to absorb the annual increment in rural population. And here we are in 2014 with, uh, with this prospect of the oil tanker just continuing to move in this direction. Now, of course, urban development policies and employment creation policies that can bend this up a little will have a huge impact in bending that curve down a little. And that's tens if not hundreds of millions of households who benefit hugely if you can just bend this a little. But that leaves hundreds of millions for sure in villages, each of which used to have 10,000 people and now it's 10,100 and 10,200 and 10,300 on the given amount of farmland and forest and water available to them. So we can look at this in a different perspective in terms of annual growth rate makes it a little sharper to sort of bring this into focus. The year-on-year -year growth rate is plotted here for the rural populations breaking out the world as a whole um, uh, here, uh, South Asia and Africa. That annual year-on-year -year population growth rate was about the same for South Asia and Africa in the 50s. This was the rural population pressure that led to the, all the demands for the Green Revolution in this period. But of course, when Africa had this rapid rate of rural population growth, it had abundant land. So Africans responded to this rural population growth rate. While Asians were responding with the Green Revolution, Africans were responding with land expansion. Of course, into less desirable land, which is why they were where they were in the first place, was because it was better than the alternative. When they moved into more and more less desire, more and more area, it was into less desirable area. But that rapid expansion continued much longer than South Asia's rural population growth continued to rise. And then the South Asian rural population growth rate turned down not long after the world as a whole rural population turned down, and the uh, Sub-Saharan African pop rural population growth rate continues to fall, but leaving this legacy of just absolutely brutal, devastating expansion <coughs> into less and less attractive places with smaller and smaller farm size that left uh, the vast bulk of African rural populations impoverished in a way that their ancestors had never, never been. Now, that headwind, if you will, is slowing. There still is a headwind because it's still above zero. Eventually, you get to zero. And when you get to zero, that's this magical moment here when the rural population begins to decline. And so once you get below this level, each remaining farm household can rent in or borrow or use the land that their neighbor and their neighbor's children no longer is using. So the typical pattern is that that village has planted out all of its land, moved into more and more um, marginal bits of land. Some people say to their neighbors, you know, I'm just going to rely on my work in town. I'm going to perhaps move away. I might retire back to the village, but you can farm my land. And so you have land rental, ultimately to this U.S. where we have many more landowners than renters because um, each, each farmer is operating land rented in from, from their neighbors who've moved, neighboring families who've moved, uh, moved on. In in the world as a whole, that becomes a massive phenomenon in the immediate future here. South Asia soon to cross below the zero line as well. So once people start farming their neighbor's land, they suddenly need, their plot may be teeny tiny, but now they need to farm the neighboring plot too. So they're interested in tractors, interested in mechanization, um, and so forth. Africans still facing a future of smaller and smaller plots, not bigger and bigger. This is an oil tanker that's not going to change. This is going to happen. Now, but that doesn't make it deterministic, right? It doesn't make it, uh, it's inevitable that rural population grows. 
but it's not inevitable how people respond to that. And the ways I've seen people respond, and I'm sure you've seen people respond, is absolutely stunning. You know, you see the example of mariculture, but there are thousands of examples of very unusual and unexpected responses to intensification, uh, to do it sustainably, to do it uh, in, in an employment generating way. Um, it's just, it's full of surprises. So this is one example that just caused me to ask the driver to slam on the brakes. You know, in Burkina in 1997, I just happened to think this is a visually pretty arresting picture of something that struck me when we were driving down the road. And I said, wait, stop, stop, stop. I want to take this picture and um, find the household and ask them what's going on here. So this is something I had read about, I knew about, um, but hadn't had a chance to take a photograph of until finding this particular family um, who were converting more and more of their fields from traditional flat planting. So this is a uh, cereal legume intercrop, as you would see all over dry land agriculture, to a technology that had been known for centuries in Burkina, Burkina being one of the most densely populated uh, parts of um, the tropical world in this very low rainfall area. The response to this grinding uh, need for intensification was what locally is called zy pits. You might think of it as micro catchments. The idea is you say, yeah, yeah, we have a big field, but it's not really a big field. Let's dig pits and have water, the limited rainfall that there is, flow into these micro catchments. And that will make it worthwhile for us to collect from our compost pits and animal manure out in the grazing areas, put that, concentrate the organic matter in the bottom of these pits to retain the moisture uh, and then we can put in a few capfuls of chemical fertilizer and put our legume and cereal combination together. I don't know about you, but that's pretty un unexpected. It has nothing to do with the trajectory of agricultural technology development you would normally have in mind, right? Because they're not mechanizing, they're the opposite, they're intensifying. They're not terracing like you saw in Asia. They're doing something that's very specific to their location. It's a solution to their problem. And this kind of location-specific and time-specific solution is what agricultural uh, innovation consists of. So this is you know, taking what appears to be a large field and turning it into a set of small, higher value fields. Now, that's agriculture. Let's think also within the household in terms of all the activities that are going on um, not just farming, but, um, but uh, household livelihoods more generally. Crucial thing that I hope is very vivid uh, for you in places where you, where you work uh, is the change in demographic structure, age structure, that African societies have experienced. This is captured here by the dependency rate in the sense of the fraction of, of children or the elderly, and for Africa it's principally the children, um, per 100 adults who are of working age that through the start of the demographic transition, having risen in Africa more than any society ever had experienced ever in any human experience whatsoever. To have almost half of people be under age 15 is completely unprecedented. And that experience took Africa from a level of like this to a level of like that of the fraction of people who are children and meant a transition for African societies in which women had a much greater burden of child care uh, to face in the 1990s than they had in previous uh, development of African societies. Now that headwind is also going away. So that as that headwind recedes, it becomes a little easier to have rapid expansion of girls' education, rapid expansion of employment opportunities for women rapid increase in the investment per child. From year to year to year, it becomes easier to do those things in a way that here, from year to year to year, into this inflection point around 1990, was harder and harder from year to year. So that's the kind of headwind become, the headwind gets, gets less and less. Uh, and then eventually you get to this um, uh, plateau and then you have elderly dependency which is very far in the future uh, for Africa. So 
these situations are demographic um, phenomena we've seen before. Each country responds to it in its own way. Each community responds to it in its own way. But it is a common feature of uh, the development pathway that, that countries are on. So this just happens to be two uh, very close by families in, uh, in Uganda. Um, you know, one much larger than another. There's lots of variation in any given place, in any given community, but that headwind, having been so severe and then going away, is a common feature uh, that Africa will face on average, uh, and that each individual project or, or program or policy choice has to really pay attention to. So when you think about policies and programs, a whole range of kinds of interventions, and want to think about what the implications of this are. The, prod the, the conclusions I'm about to share come from a project that involved Tom uh, thinking about how this worked out for Africa or will work out for Africa, Tom Reardon for Asia, and then specific angles on it by other scholars you may have um, worked with in the past, and then a set of discussants bringing a variety of perspectives. This was funded by the uh, Science Council of the CGIAR in order to come to some insight as to what was going to happen to smallholders because of urbanization. Basic conclusion, increasing diversity. Right? Asia is having smaller, uh, uh, having beginning to have increasing farm sizes. Africa continuing to have shrinking farm sizes. Commercialization spreading. So what you have is what Tom Reardon calls this quiet revolution, that as transport costs fall and spread from the port or the city to the countryside, there's this spread of commercial dynamism that has a kind of, uh, of half-life as it spreads out into the countryside. And further and further from the city, you might have commercial activity um, at higher, higher levels over time. But then there's many farmers remaining in them. So there's this increasing diversity because the people in the, in the dynamic zone, close to town, close to the road, uh, get a, a, an experience of agricultural change that's completely different from those who are remote. This has a huge impact for what you can do in terms of agribusiness. People who remain very remote, the fertilizer to grain price ratio is going to be prohibitive. Even as their cousins who are closer, it'll be a transformational change when they. So that increasing diversity is really striking. There's also an important angle to this through what happens to farm sizes, as particularly in the dynamic zones close to town or somehow connected, uh, we see agriculture, broadly speaking, remaining a family enterprise throughout the development process and across the world, whether that's a half an acre Taiwanese rice farm or a several hundred acre Mississippi rice farm, whether it's a several hundred acre Mississippi cotton farm or a 10 acre Malian cotton farm, at radically different income levels, every one of those enterprises is a mom, pop, and the kids operation. The Mississippi cotton farmer is a millionaire many times over and flies his own plane to Washington for a hearing on cotton policy, literally. The Malian cotton farmer may be an impoverished, relatively uh, impoverished uh, uh, um, uh, household. That farm size being tailored to family enterprise is the rule, but it's the rule only for most crops. It's the rule despite scale economies and processing and marketing. So each of these households is interacting with a big input supplier and selling to a big product marketer, but remains a household enterprise. And that is um, the way agriculture develops. Um, but that means that this family size farm is varying a lot across time and place. So you, this average farm size is, is, is shifting, and that's creating this diversity uh, around the world. So you want to think about each individual program or policy change in terms of this kind of, of lens, I think, I think you would find it helpful uh, to do that. Zooming into the commercialization aspect, when you are um, 
developing an agricultural uh, technology set, we can say, the crop chemicals, the mechanization environment, and so forth, and the value chains, we might say, that serve the farmer with marketing opportunities, each of those has to be tailored to the local crop mix and costs and so forth. These are going to be large enterprises relative, you know, serving hundreds, uh, at least dozens if not hundreds, and in some cases thousands of farmers with one seed supplier, one machinery supplier, one pump set manufacturer, or one, um, uh, and then on the, on the marketing side, similarly, one dairy cooperative or one uh, um, grain processor serving dozens or hundreds of farmers, even as farm size remains. Uh, so what you want to make sure you're sort of trying to do is provide the public sector support for many competing input suppliers, where many means dozens, not, not thousands. Meanwhile, though, you don't want to lose sight of the uh, often majority who are out of literal sight because to get to them you'd have to park the, the car or truck and, and walk and walk and walk. Um, those people uh, have the opportunity for income growth. It is entirely possible to grow incomes with very low input uh, and very low product marketing. Um, but it's going to be with public domain technology because they're going to be buying seed, perhaps, that's easy to headload into the, uh, you know, far off the road, but they're not going to be buying fertilizer. They're certainly not interested in machinery because they have more and more labor uh, per, for everything uh, from year to year. And, and, um, and taking that into account is really crucial. And remember that exceptions arise. Exceptions are incredibly important and they're exceptions. So it's very hard to predict exactly how a dynamic zone will grow. People who think that a certain place is the next big thing may be wildly successful, and they may be bankrupt in a decade. Um, and there's opportunities for income growth both in the dynamic commercial zone and in the low input hinterland, but they're different opportunities. So this idea of a patchwork in which uh, increasing diversity uh, is, um, is at hand is very important, is very helpful. For farm structure, keeping in mind that agriculture is a family enterprise, whether it's Australia or the United States or Korea or India or wherever, you know, why is that? That's because supervising workers is very hard in agriculture. People might have uh, trusted workers you work with. You can have seasonal workers often. You can do labor exchange with your neighbors, work parties and so forth. But supervising labor is just a lot harder in agriculture than in many other industries, most other industries. Um, but there are scale economies in machinery and management. So you want to find some ways to have family agriculture relate to um, things that have scale economies. So the average farm size is just mechanically this. There's just no way around that average, even as farm families diversify and, and, and migrate uh, to different degrees. There's tremendous heterogeneity in that, right? So some families are extremely um, lucky <laughs> or skilled or energetic and are able to far have large farms in a given village. Others perhaps have good or less good quality land. All those things matter. Um, and this exception of the investor-owned farm who hi that hires workers is an exception that, that arises and sometimes succeeds. So there are situations where there's a big enough scale economy in this machinery and management that it's actually worthwhile for the machine owner and the, and the management, skilled manager, to actually just, just own the whole farm. And that exception does arise. It arises and it persists in three main crops in the world. In every other crop, it arises, but it doesn't persist. So you can think about the history of many tropical crops as the history of people who gained income and wealth and capability in temperate zone agriculture and said, I can do that really well. Let me hire a bunch of workers. If need be, have serfs or slaves or something like that 
and I'm going to be the lord of this empire. And plantations have arisen in every period of human history. They have arisen in every continent where a rich community, agriculturally based perhaps, has seen the opportunity to take over some land. And plantation agriculture of that type has come and has gone everywhere. And what you see all over uh, the places you work, I'm sure, is the legacy of former colonial plantations that are now bankrupt, that went bankrupt soon after independence um, and may or may not have given way to a vibrant smallholder farm uh, system, but uh, they certainly are bankrupt. They can't compete with smallholder agriculture elsewhere. So that's the case of plantation uh, tree crops, so plantation coffee and cocoa. It's the case of plantation uh, cotton, of course. Um, it's the case for plantation, uh, um, there have been histories of plantation rice and so forth. It tends not to be the case for plantation tea, sugar, and oil palm. And those are crops that turn out to, where, to, to be places where, crops where immediate processing is absolutely crucial. So growing tea is the easy bit. Growing sugar is the easy bit. Same more or less with oil palm. The hard part is getting it into processing quickly. And so it's worthwhile to have an investor-owned plantation for those crops. Um, sometimes there's uh, a packaging for transport linkage that's absolutely crucial. So you may have a plantation of these things too. Sometimes, and this is the much more widespread thing, there's a part of agriculture where it's just pretty easy to supervise the workers. So this is most uh, notably the case for livestock. So you can easily have a very concentrated livestock sector where a few uh, large livestock owners will own a relatively large number of animals per, per um, uh, and there's, there's a few crops, horticulture, tree crops and things, you would see this. So innovations can potentially expand this investor-owned ag sector, but um, so you might think about, for example, GPS on variable rate machinery, making it possible for a large-scale investor. But in general, the idea of the person coming from a wealthy society in order to own a farm in a poor country has an ancient history from the ancient Romans doing that in Gaul, in, in what's now France, to um, Australians trying to spread across Australia and have investor-owned agriculture. In the US, they were called bonanza farms in the Dakotas when wealthier people in the East thought they could run agriculture in the Dakotas for wheat like a, like a, like a factory. The Dakota, the, uh, Dakota uh, Bonanza farms lasted about 15, 20 years. The uh, farms in Australia, about the same. Uh, some societies managed to sustain their plantations for a bit longer than that, but they are all succeeded by household farms in the end. Uh, w except for the cases that are the exceptional places. So what happens for farm size? Farm sizes uh, in Asia are going to grow from the very small base that they're now. So you might have now half a hectare, one hectare farm, but in the next few years, it's gonna be 1.25, 1.52 hectares. So you're interested in a little bit more machinery to expand. Uh, in the dynamic zones, you can have output per acre, output per farmer rising very fast because of the rapid innovation from the input suppliers. If they are competitive with each other, if they can innovate very quickly, you could have rapid uptake of new machinery. Uh, but in Africa, the average farm size is shrinking. This oil tanker is not going to turn around very quickly. The um, rate of shrinkage of land per rural person is <laughs> slowing down, so it's less of a headwind from year to year. But and that makes it easier and easier to, to cope up with it, um, but it's still rapid. In some regions, it's possible to organize migration into previously unpopulated, but you have to solve the problem that caused people to not live there in the first place. Those problems are typically disease problems, but they're often infrastructure problems as well. So what we see, for example, in Ethiopia with the opening up of hot lowlands is due in part to disease control and in part to irrigation as well as roads. But if you don't move in with clinics and, uh, and schools, it's not possible for people to move. Turns out that moving people on a large scale is one of the hardest human enterprises ever. It's just 
fraught with failure. There's an occasional success, but it's extremely hard to move large numbers of people. Um, so this contrast is absolutely central to the sort of headwind, tailwind question. The slides that you have provide a bunch of charts and tables that give sort of more um, data and some interpretation that, that lie behind those conclusions. But I think it's probably best to just stop with that, with uh, the few charts I've shown, um, and, and move to, to discussion. Is that, is that fair? Is that the right way to proceed? Ed? 